Thank you for coming out. Um, I really appreciate it. I know it's a Friday afternoon, and so I'm grateful to you for carving this hour out of your day today. Before I begin, uh, I want to thank the Polk Museum of Art, Alex Rich, and Laura Putnam for inviting me to come here today. It's sort of a surreal experience. I can remember as an undergraduate in a women's studies class, I believe Whitney Chadwick's Women, Art, and Society was our text for the class. And turning the page and seeing a work by Romaine Brooks for the first time. And I was really struck by it. It was, of course, her self-portrait from 1923, which in many ways has become her signature, her iconic piece. And we will be talking about that some today. But I, I was immediately struck by Brooks. And so it's a surreal experience to now be standing here with you in front of, right, encircled by her work. Um, so, and it's been a good 20 years since uh, that happened. So uh, it's, it's been a long time coming. So uh, a disclaimer, as Laura revealed, I am neither Brooks scholar nor art historian. I am an English professor with a background in gender studies and visual culture studies. So today very much, I'm hoping that this will be a conversation more so than a lecture and that we can open up a discussion about women in representation, which is um, something that I have a very deep interest in and a long held interest in. Um, my dissertation when I was at Florida State actually looked at how women writers from the late 19th and early 20th century in the same time period when Brooks was living and working were using the figure of the fictional woman painter to enter into conversations about representation and visuality and the ways in which women writers used the woman painter to um, challenge hegemonic gender roles. So this is really what interests me about Brooks's work as well. So I think when talking about a woman artist, particularly a visual artist, it's impossible not to talk first about women's complicated history with representation. Um, women as image. Right? Um, this is sort of an inescapable fact of women's history. Woman as object, woman as subject of the male gaze. And so for any woman artist, in terms of representing themselves and other women, one of the first questions becomes, of course, right? how do you visually represent women without reaffirming woman as object? right, um, woman as, right? Um, a, a, you know, sort of a um, sexual figure, right, an object of heterosexual male desire. And this is certainly something that Brooks was contending with. And part of what I think is really fascinating about her work is its complexity and the subtle ways and not so subtle ways, she creates a disturbance in the field and challenges our expectations. So there are a number of theorists who have talked about this complex history that women have as a visual subject, whether we're talking about Laura Mulvey, film studies, or John Berger, a famous art historian, right? Berger wrote that, um, you know, men act and women appear. Men are judged by their accomplishments. Women are judged by how they look. And so for women, appearance has always been important, integral to who they are because their success has depended upon it, right? Um, if women are primarily valued for their appearance, you have to consider how you look, how you're presenting yourself to the world. And this is certainly something that preoccupied Brooks, so a little background about her, if you're not familiar with her as an artist, and this will be very brief, because as I mentioned, I'm not a Brooks scholar, but um, she was born in 1874. She was actually born in Rome, but her parents were American citizens. They divorced not long after her birth. She was the third child. Her mother was both very wealthy and very cruel, and Brooks lived a kind of gothic childhood. 
um, both in terms of abuse from her mother. She was actually even abandoned at one point, and I think raised by the maid for a period of time before being brought back home. Her mother was not particularly interested in her or her sister and really doted on uh, her son the most of the three. It was in 1902 when her mother died and she inherited a large fortune that she began to gain some semblance of independence. And really this fortune allowed her to operate outside of social norms to a certain extent, right? It, it granted her certain freedoms. Um, she did marry, Brooks was her married name, a man um, not long after her mother died, I think within a year after her mother died, and that marriage only lasted about a year. She self-identified as a lesbian, and most of her lasting relationships were with women in her lifetime. So woman as artist. In the 19th century, you really saw the rise of the professional artists. You saw the rise of the art school, the arts academy, and professional training for artists. This was both a wonderful thing and a hindrance to women because they were often barred from academic study. Um, primarily, they were barred from studying the female or the nude, either female or male. And since this was considered, the courses were scaffolded, right? So I think you started with drawing from the cast and moved up where the final level of training would be drawing from the human figure. Since women were often barred from these classes, this was also a way to suggest that women had not reached the apex of academic training. You did have schools both in the US and in Europe that were beginning to admit women and you had painters like Thomas Eakins who were gaining a lot of notoriety and even getting fired at times for allowing women into life classes and life classes that had both men and women. Because one way that they got around this at first was to say, well, women can draw from the nude, but we want all women in the room as if then we were somehow safe from any kind of sexual feeling by removing men from the room. So, Brooks did receive academic training, first in Rome. She was actually the only female student in an all-male academy, and it wasn't easy for her. One of the male students, uh, Cassandra Longer, one of her biographers, actually writes about how one of the male students in Rome would leave pornographic images on her chair before she would come in to work each day in the studio. And finally, so incensed, she apparently walloped him with a book. And he left her alone after that. So, <laughs> so, so this is very much the world that Brooks is living in. Women painters, women artists in general in the 19th century were often ridiculed in the media, in the magazines of the day, in the literature of the day as being unwomanly. That being an artist was something that unsexed women. To, to be an artist as a woman, it was acceptable, particularly in the late and into the early 19th century, to be a genteel artist, right? Um, to be within the culture of accomplishments. You, you dabbled in watercolor, or you could draw a little, or you might play the piano a little, or sing a little, to entertain guests in the parlor. To do this professionally, to attempt to publish one's work, to circulate or sell one's work, meant not only sort of the stain of commercialism, right, but it, it was seen as utterly monstrous. This was the purview of men, not of women. And so you had, for example, is everyone familiar with Charles Dana Gibson? He was a 19th century illustrator who was famous for his Gibson girl. And this was the girl who wore the long worsted skirt, had a wasp-like waist, right? Um, she wore the starched button-down white shirt. Her hair was always upswept. 
She was tall, she was very, very thin, she had a little turned up nose and a perfect little bowed mouth, and she became an icon for female beauty and femininity in the late 19th century. Reproduced so often that they even had wallpaper with just Gibson girl heads on it that was marketed for bachelor's apartments. And, <laughs> and, and we who are used to sort of in a post Star Wars world marketing, this was the kind of marketing that the Gibson girl received. You could buy Gibson girl ties, um, Gibson girl pens, plates, any kind of commemorative item you could imagine. So you started to see this figure appearing over and over again as an ideal of femininity and as a very limited ideal of white, female American, right, um, femininity. So Gibson also humorously in the 1890s published an illustration in Life magazine. It was a two-page spread that was titled The Woman Artist Who Has Ceased to Be Feminine. And the illustration pictures a woman in her studio, and the studio has what we might expect to see from a late 19th century bohemian studio. So you have the tiger rug on the floor, a number of easels on the walls. You see a litter of drawings on the ground of the female nude, which suggests that she is looking at and drawing from the nude form, which would be scandalous for a woman at the time. Uh, she's wearing a large smock that conceals her figure, and she's leaning over in uh, a position that is Right? Not, but not the way that women are taught to sit. And she's sort of gawking at uh, two patrons who have come to her space to commission a painting. And then Gibson sort of ridicules as well the work that she's doing. Because behind her, there's a large canvas. And on the canvas is a drawing of Little Bo Peep. So, <laughs> um, but, but the insinuation here is that as a professional artist, she has unsexed herself. And while this was familiar rhetoric for women artists in all fields, we're familiar with the figure of the female blue stocking, which was the literary or intellectual woman who was drawn as unattractive and unfeminine and loud and coarse. For visual artists, painters and sculptors, this was an even more difficult terrain to navigate because you had an art that was particularly physical, something that required you to lug paintings about through the streets in a way that marked you, that made you noticeable. As well, the work itself was very physical so that you would have You'd be working, say, if you're working with oils, be working with turpentine, have paint on yourself, right? Or if you're carving, developing muscles from working with the marble raw, raw materials. So, so women artists were navigating a very difficult space in the time period. And the question became for women how to push back against this. Some women then went in a direction of hyperfemininity or exaggerated femininity as a way to reassert their womanliness. Brooks, of course, does not do this in her paintings. We don't see her um, pushing back in this kind of a way, but instead really, I think, challenging us in terms of how we define what feminine is, what it means to be a woman, what it means to be an artist at the time. Part of what's interesting too about Brooks, and this is something that a number of scholars working on her have remarked upon, is how stylish she is. And this is one way that Brooks made marginalization sexy, if you will, being an outsider um, appealing and uh, you know, desirous and, and decadent. In the late 19th century, women who were sort of throwing off the confines of femininity were, like artists themselves, ridiculed in the press. So that you had, you may be familiar with the bloomer costume, so this was named for an American woman by the name of Amelia Jinks Plumer who made the costume popular. But when women first adopted this form of dress, they called it rational dress because they were trying to make themselves more mobile in an urban 
and right, industrializing society. So they wore these sort of, they, it wasn't fashionable, right? They wore these um, loose pants with this tiny skirt over it. And leaders of the women's movement in the United States who had originally adopted this form of dress actually quickly abandoned it because it was bringing bad publicity to the movement. So Susan B. Anthony, for example, right, one of the leaders of women's suffrage in the United States, she would wear the bloomer costume, but then you would see her ridiculed in the magazine. And she even started to lose women that she was trying to right, pull into the movement who saw her and thought she cuts a ridiculous figure I don't want to be associated with that. And Anthony realized this was getting bad press. And with any social movement, especially in the late 19th century, they started to realize that marketing mattered. <laughs> so um, Anthony quickly changed her way of dress. Now, Brooks, as you can see, and we'll talk a little bit about how she presents herself in her images, um, she is fashionable. Um, she was sort of the height of fashion at her time. So Paris in the 1920s, a lot of what Brooks is doing in terms of her lifestyle, in terms of representation, would not have been so easy had she been in New York, had she been in London. Paris in the 1920s was a city of decadence. In many ways, it was a city that embraced fluidity, that embraced experimentation, that embraced different kinds of people that even celebrated outsiders. And this allowed her, as well as her wealth, to operate sort of free from <laughs> some of the restraints that she may have experienced had she been trying to fend for herself economically or had she been back stateside. So I want to ask you, as I pose this question, how do women represent themselves given the troubled history of women in representation? If we look around the room at this collection of paintings by Brooks, I'm going to ask and we'll see if I can try and convince you to, to engage with me. But if, if you will describe a little what you see does this seem typical? Is it surprising? Yes. Dark. OK. Most of them are, all of them, I think, are very dark. OK. Yeah, absolutely. One of the first things that might strike us is the lack of color. We're dealing with blacks, grays, browns, very subdued tones. And if we think about women, these are not the colors that we're accustomed to associating with women, blacks and browns and dark, seemingly sort of somber colors and tones. Women, we think of bright colors, pastels, um, those that are associated with femininity. So yes, dark. What else? OK, absolutely. <laughs> um, she said there's a representation of class because of costume. And this, I think, is one of the things that we're seeing Brooks challenge, not just gender representation, but the bourgeoisie in some respects. She's both uh, using her class to free her and is freed because of class. So absolutely. What else? OK. They seem emotionless, stoic. Would you agree? Yes. OK, absolutely, right? So a celebration of androgyny. And we'll definitely come back to this as an important move that she makes to challenge our ideas about what it means to be male or, or what it means to be female. Anything else? Yes. Okay, absolutely. I mean, we're seeing not only is she really focused on woman as subject, but she's refiguring women in spaces 
that are unfamiliar spaces for women to be depicted in. She is really challenging the way that we think of women's appearance um, on, on the canvas. And we see very much, she is depicting women as, if we've been talking about women and passivity, right? Men as agents, women as image, as passive. Here, this, this is not how she's picturing women at all, really, right? We have woman as artist over and over again because she's painting her group of friends and really validating women in the arts and imbuing them with the power of the creator, the producer. We see her <laughs> depicting women as heroes, as warriors, right? as Amazons. We see her um, depicting women in unconventional and surprising ways where they are potentially even making us uncomfortable a little. And I think that's part of what the challenge of, of Brooks's work is, is that it seems unfamiliar, it's complex, it's dark, it's foreboding, it's stoic, <laughs> um, it's unfamiliar, and it really challenges us to think about what is it that we're seeing, what biases do we bring with us when we first encounter this painting, and how do we reconcile what she's doing with our ideas. So I wanted to look a little bit at a couple of specific works in greater detail. I don't know how everyone would feel about traveling. Maybe? Um, <laughs> so some traveling, or we can just turn around. But I thought we would look at her most iconic work, the work that has really become her signature, which is her self-portrait from 1923. So this is undoubtedly her most famous work, the one that is most often reproduced. I think it's also very startling that we have a long tradition of women's self-portraits. There's nothing quite like this one, um, particularly at the time. And even to this day, it, it stands apart as a remarkable accomplishment. So I'd like to ask you to describe what you see in this image and how Brooks has pictured herself. She looks like she rides a horse. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Absolutely. And there was sort of a, a, there was actually, and I don't know a lot about this, maybe Dr. Rich will save us later on, but there was a kind of history of women presenting themselves as equestrians as a way to challenge dress. But yes, okay. So it is. it does feel reminiscent of that. What else? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's hard to miss her. Uh, she has a, a dominating presence in this image. What else? Okay, absolutely, right? And this is, and this is something I want to come back to, the way that she is, has sort of one foot in, in each camp in terms of our expectations about gender. So that there is this kind of shocking in terms of her clothing, and then you have this powdered face and these reddened lips, which suggest her femininity, right? Or that this is a, a woman in the picture. What else? She certainly doesn't look rich. And I've noticed that even the nudes, they're so skinny, it makes you worry about them. It's not the voluptuous. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. And this is part of the way that she's creating a disturbance in the field because we have expectations of what a female nude is going to look like and an idea about what female beauty is, which is a curvy, voluptuous form. And what we get here is a much more boyish figure, a much more androgynous figure which again can be unsettling at first because the female nude is something that we're all very accustomed to seeing 
over and over again in history. What else? The eyes in shadow, that I think you know it's mystery. That's what I'm about herself. Absolutely. It's one of the things that makes me want to keep staring at this picture. Right? It's sort of, she seems to elude our gaze, right? She's looking at us and yet remains concealed. And it, and it it's, it's really captivating. It's a, it's a brilliant technique. Yeah, the spot, like you said, you almost feel that she's more actively looking at you than you are at her. Absolutely. Absolutely, right? Um, which, again, and I'm going to, and I'll, I, I want to talk about how one scholar talks about how she places us, the viewer, and come back to that, right? But she is more observer than she is observed, which is a brilliant maneuver on her part. Okay, and does it have that effect on us as a viewer? Do we feel a certain disconnect from Brooks in this painting? Okay. <laughs> okay, so in that way, she's really reminding us that we are implicated in this process of looking. She is making us hyper aware uh, that we are looking at her, right? Um, what do you notice, too, about the background? Overcast. Not much light on the buildings. Absolutely. Okay, so it's a dark space. And, and what's figured in the background? I don't know how easy this is for everyone to see. Yeah, so she's standing on what appears to be a balcony. Now, for, for women in paintings, this is interesting, and I know Dr. Rich could probably talk about this for quite some time, but right, balconies were this, this safe space for women to be in public, yet still private. And it was also a way that woman as spectacle was really celebrated. So you have a, a history of, especially during the Impressionist movement, of women being depicted on balconies or in opera boxes in the loge, right, at the opera where you are both protected and visible and seen. Um, Griselda Pollock, who's a really great art historian, has talked about what she terms the spaces of femininity in the visual arts. And these include domestic spaces as well as what she terms spaces of bourgeois recreation, places where it was okay for women to be in public. So perhaps riding through a carriage in the park, or boating, or at a picnic. Part of what's interesting here is that this is not a space of femininity, right? <laughs> that she has surrounded herself with. She's on a balcony, but she's not looking out. She's looking at us, which suggests that we're actually in the interior space, and the power of the world is behind her. And I take this reading um, from uh, Terza Latimer, who I think has done some of the best scholarship on this work. But she points out, right, and Brooks had done other balcony portraits before, and you have the Cocteau is here, right? The Yes, thanks, Laura. I could hear, I can't see you, but I could hear you. There you are, um, right? Um, which we could potentially look at in a minute, but which is also a balcony scene facing in, but it's a very different background than what we have here. So she's placed us really in the interior space and she's in this kind of liminal space and behind her, we see the symbols of modernity and symbols of progress. We see water. We see buildings, right? This seems urban. Um, it seems progressive. So it's a really interesting way to figure herself, right? And as we think about the artist having historically been presented or defined as a male, part of that involved genius, individualism, right? And this is what she seems to claim for herself 
in this picture. But there is this sort of, you know, unsettling disturbance in the lipstick, perhaps, where, and I like that she almost has a kind of coy or wry smile, as if she's both claiming the position of the artist, a position that's been historically defined as being male. She's claiming it for herself and yet reminding us that she is a woman, right? Um, and at, almost at the same time. What about the way that she is dressed? Hmm? Very masculine? Okay, how so? Okay. The gloves. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't uncommon for women to adopt this style of dress. And Brooks actually designed her own clothes. She was very much a woman who was, I was talking, and I saw Felicia here, but I was talking to some of my women's studies students the other day about the new woman which was really a global figure that emerged in the late 19th century, a reaction to very limited conceptions of what it meant to be female or feminine in the mid 19th and early 19th century. And there's a literary historian by the name of Martha Patterson who writes that although the new woman was a number of different things, right? Who met, she, it was a trope that meant different things to different people and often signified um, contested identities in some ways. Patterson argues that at her heart, the new woman connotes a distinctly modern ideal of self-refashioning. And that's part of what I think is powerful about Brooks, is the way that she is claiming representative power and determining and controlling how she presents herself to the world. Yes? When you look at her right hand, it almost looks like she's, she's telling you back off, I may have something in my pocket. That's <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, it That's is. It's not a natural position to have in her hand. No, she feels posed. And as we're talking about being kind of standoffish, it's interesting, too. I mean, she's wearing gloves. She's not holding her gloves, right? They're on. And actually in the Cocteau painting, he's holding a glove, his glove in his hand, which allows a kind of intimacy or suggests that he's perhaps more relaxed. Nothing about her really seems relaxed, right? This is a formal, posed, controlled image. And she wants us to see her as in control, right? As dominating the, the landscape that she inhabits here. And yes, please. I'm looking at the landscape behind her, and this is water, and it's, and it's not even like that's not the way the horizon is. And I remember in Mona Lisa, she had something similar. Okay. There was, what effect does it have on you, this kind of skewed? Yeah, I'm, it doesn't jive, because I would expect the horizon to be straight. Okay, sort of unbroken in mm -hmm. the background. So perhaps suggesting a kind of disturbance in the field by her very presence. And it's interesting, even though um, I've, I've learned too about buttons, because I think if you're used to buying clothes for a particular gender, you don't know this. Yeah, men and women have the reverse buttons. Men and women have buttons on different sides of their clothes. And although Brooks designed these clothes herself, from the hat to the jacket, everything else, she is really a self-created woman, right? Um, the buttons are on the man's side of her coat, which is an interesting choice. Yes. Absolutely. 
Absolutely, right? Um, and this comes, and I really like that comparison because this is what we think so often when we look at, say, the paintings of Degas, of women, right, in the opera balcony and everyone looking up at them and they're sort of leaning forward with these low cut dresses, very feminine and seductive. And this was one of the ways that women operated as a spectacle and lured suitors, right? And she is uh, defiant of that, right? Um, Right. <laughs> well, and I think, you know, that's one of the interesting things about self-portraits and about the history of the representation of women is that, you know, women are often have been described as being vain, as being preoccupied with their appearance, which is one of those frustrating things where you say, but, but patriarchal society, you're valuing us for our appearance, and then at the same time, you're condemning us for caring about it, right? Um, and so you often saw women who were pictured in the art holding a mirror, right? And sort of, and this is something that the hist art historian John Berger talks about, right? Where he wrote that women would be painted for the pleasure of a heterosexual male viewer, perhaps as a nude writer in a seductive way, but then be pictured holding a mirror and called vanity. And you're saying, well, again, this is unfair, right? I, <laughs> um, this wasn't how I chose to be pictured, right? Um, and so I think that raises an interesting question. If you are painting a self-portrait, you do. You have to look at your reflection in order to be able to do that. And I think that makes it even more interesting that her eyes are hidden. Because it creates, again, this kind of disturbance of how is she even sort of looking at herself with <laughs> this sort of veiled um, gaze or, or expression. It looks like the light is coming from maybe either one third or two o'clock position directly in front of her. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's more technical about light than I usually am. I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> absolutely. And again, I think that this works to establish that sense of contrast that she our eye is drawn to her and even drawn down the image of the picture because of the white lapel um, latimer interestingly talks in her chapter on brooks brooks i don't know for how long until she gave the painting to the Smithsonian or wherever it went first, but she apparently kept it in her apartment. And her apartment very much was a continuation of her paintings. She controlled every aspect of her life. She was very aware of display and self-presentation, which was important for artists in the late and early 20th century. As you saw the professionalization of the artist, you also saw with the rise of the periodical press that the artist now was a celebrity in a way that they had not been before. And this is something um, the art historian Sarah Burns writes about a lot inventing in her book, Inventing the Modern Artist. But she argues that starting in the late 19th century, an artist to succeed had to know how to market themselves as well as their work. And that artists who were successful knew how to tap into this. And so we might think about say, some of the artists that influenced her, somebody like a James McNeil Whistler. Whistler was a master of self-presentation and of marketing. And Brooks was in some ways herself, but at the same time, incredibly private. So you see her kind of navigating this space. She didn't have to sell her work, she did. She didn't have to exhibit her work, but she did. Um, and, and at the same time that she was very careful about self-presentation, she was also very guarded in terms of her personal life. But she, the beginning of my story, now I remember, she kept this painting in her apartment and would, when people would come over, she would say, um, c'est moi, to, the, to them, right? That's me which is a really interesting, right? not just sort of, you know, psychological disassociation, right, from the self, but it's interesting in terms of she was purely a self-creation, right? This is me, what I have constructed and presented before you. Um, so I want to put this painting in conversation with a couple of others before we finish, and I have no idea what time it is. 14 minutes. 14 minutes. All right. We will. <laughs> okay. 
Five minutes? All right. We can do that. Um, so I wanted to talk about this painting to wrap up in terms of the way that she's challenging our expectations. So if you haven't had a chance to look at the title, that's good, I'm going to stand in front of it if, if you're not familiar with the title. But I want you to start by, again, describing to me what you see. I'm not sure if it's male or female. Okay. So the gender is unclear to us, perhaps. What else? Okay, absolutely, right? Here we don't have, say, the cityscape or any other defining features that we see in so many of the other canvases in the room. We just have this kind of cracked wall space. Okay, so the figure is looking away from us, not engaging our gaze at all. Kind of uptight, nothing languid about it. Okay, <laughs> yes, again, it feels, okay, absolutely, it feels reserved, very posed. Honestly, I think the only reason we're questioning the gender of this person is, you know, given, I guess, it's their surroundings, because otherwise I think that it would be as soon as it's a male. Okay, yeah, I think that's, a really <laughs> powerful observation, right? It's the juxtaposition, it's knowing that this is Brooks, it's seeing these other images that we immediately began to question, hmm, our assumptions. And so the title of this painting is Peter, and then as a parenthetical aside, a young English girl. So really this becomes an interesting challenge to us as viewers about our expectations in terms of gender, in terms of presentation. And a young English girl seems to modify two different signs that we're confronted with that challenge our expectations. The first, in looking at this, we might not question the gender had it not been for the surroundings and knowing the artist. Two, if we saw Peter, that might reaffirm, right, as the, the verbal sign attached to this visual sign, what we're seeing in the image. And then you have this surprising, and this was Brooks that titled this image, right? Then you have this surprising, uh, you know, sort of marginalized, <laughs> right, um, subtitle of a young English girl. Now, this is a painting of um, Hannah Gluckenstein, who was also a painter. So this is another portrait of an artist. And she went by Peter from a young age, didn't identify as Hannah, I think was sometimes called Tim and Alfred as well by lovers, um, and then started to market herself as Gluck. And she also has some really fantastic paintings that I recommend Googling later on. But, I mean, this kind of challenge to us, this disruption in terms of expectation, if we think of what a painting is going to be of a young English girl, and that is, Gluck was English. She is young at the time of this painting. So this, this is where Brooks is really powerfully challenging our expectations, the biases and the stereotypes that we bring with us in terms of what we think a woman looks like, what we think an artist looks like, how we're defining gender. And this is part of what's so powerful to, about Brooks for me, are these disruptions in the field, are the ways in which she is forcing us to question visuality. Uh, in general, in terms of identity and identity construction. And we can see her leading into the kinds of constructivist theories that will come much later in terms of theory. So I'll end before opening things up for questions. There's, a, there's actually a poem that Natalie Barney wrote describing Brooks and their friends, right, their circle of friends, that has the lines, to other to be even an object of hatred. And I think that that's something that she manages to do here in a really powerful way. These images are in some ways both so familiar and so unfamiliar that she has managed to make a marginalized population, lesbians of the early 20th century, seductive, appealing, progressive, modern, cool, trendy, 
uh, in a really in a really incredible way.